God-centered decisions. In using the freedom God has given us, we should always make decisions that are within His will. Here's Gene. Now, what's the basis of that? Well, let, uh, take a look at um, 1 Samuel 8, and just the first part of the verse, in, in verse 19. The people refused to listen to Samuel. Now, you've got to get the context, because he was quoting the Lord here. When he talked to the people, they asked for a king, and so Samuel said, let me tell you what's going to happen when you get a king. If you go back in the context, he says, the king will take your sons, and uh, he will use them within his sphere of operation. He will take your daughters, and He will make them servants. That will be the right of this king. At least He'll do what other kings do. Uh, he will take the best of your fields, uh, because He will start taxing you, and, and He will take your fields. He will take the best of your vineyards. He will take a tenth of your grain. Uh, he will take a tenth of your vineyards. He will. Uh, he will take a tenth of your flocks. He will make you servants. This is what goes with kingship. If you want a king, Samuel said, this is going to happen. And actually, if you go back in the Scriptures there, he was quoting God Himself. They were going to pay a price for wanting a king. Well, how did they respond? Well, look at the next statement. No. No. And it's just that deliberate. No, they said. In the full light of knowledge that Samuel was sharing with them, he had judged them, he had pastored them, he had cared for them, and they just simply deliberately said, No. We must have a king over us, which was obviously a human decision. And in their hearts, they were rejecting God as their king. Then we'll be like all the other nations. Now, that didn't make Samuel feel very good, because he had been a very faithful judge. They were rejecting Samuel, of course. They were rejecting God. Our king will judge us, go out before us, fight our battles. And then Samuel, according really to the Lord's word here, Samuel listened to all the people's words and then repeated them to the Lord. He took these words back to the Lord. Of course, the Lord had heard of them anyway, but He repeated it. And so, listen to them, the Lord told Samuel. Appoint a king for them. Now, it's important here, I think, that we need to understand something that God had said through Moses, which is recorded in the book of Deuteronomy in the sense that they had freedom to have a king, but they were to do so with pure motives. And so, asking for a king was not Israel's primary sin. God had given them this freedom in the laws outlined by Moses. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 to 15, He had given them freedom to have a king, but He warned them about what would happen if their motives were wrong. So what was the problem here? The Lord was displeased because they wanted to put their trust in a man rather than in Him. That was the problem. And it was very clear that that was what they were trying to do. And so we read on. A man rather than God. That's where they wanted to put their trust. If they had asked with pure hearts, they would have been in God's will. He would have allowed this, because they would have approached it totally differently, and God would have helped them in the process. Uh, however, they asked, they acted with impure motives, even though they knew they and their children would suffer some very severe consequences. God had warned them what would happen if, indeed, they had a king and that king did not pursue the Lord. If that king 
was selfish if that king would live out of the will of God. And obviously, uh, that's what happened with the most of the kings of Israel, both in Judah and in uh, the ten tribes, which, which was called the nation of Israel, the southern tribe and the northern tribes. And it certainly happened to Saul, as we, we see the story unfold. So the point we're making here is that we need to make uh, God-centered decisions. We, God has given us freedom. But in the freedom, we're to walk in the will of God. And we have a, a statement of that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you were called to be free brothers. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. That is a perfect description of what happened to Israel. They used the freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That was their focus. Impure motives, selfishness, pride, arrogance, uh, ignoring God, an opportunity for the flesh, rather than serving one another through love, rather than even respecting Samuel, who had devoted his life to ministering to them, caring for them, rejected him, uh, ultimately rejected God by rejecting him and not following uh, the Lord's will. So here's an Old Testament illustration of Galatians 5.13, and yet this is written to us, and we have to be extremely careful that we never use the freedom that God's given us for the flesh, but always to serve one another in love. Uh, the question for reflection and response, what are some activities God has created for our benefit that we can use in ways that violate the will of God? Well, we could list several things, but one of the things that comes to the top of the list that we see throughout biblical history is taking material blessings and using those material blessings in a selfish way. Uh, Paul had to address that in his letter to Timothy. He's writing to Timothy who's working with believers when, when he wrote these words in 1 Timothy chapter 6, but those who want to be rich fall into temptation a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction." Now we know from Scripture there's nothing wrong with riches per, per se, but it's the motive. Because he goes on to say, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That was the motivation for riches, was the love of money. Not money per se, but the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it some have wandered away from the faith, pierced themselves with many pains." So here's a wonderful gift that God has given us. Material things, material blessings, particularly in our culture. And as Christians, even, we can become vulnerable to take God's gift, the freedom that God has given us, and use it for selfish purposes. And we have to be on guard against that. Paul warns against that. And we know that that's an issue because materialism was one of the great culprits throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, and it shouldn't surprise us that we can fall victim to this. And, and we can use God's gift in a very selfish way. But there's another area, and that's the wonderful gift that God has given, and that's the gift of uh, sexual desire and, and, uh, and sex as God has designed it in marriage. And if you go back to Ephesians, for example, Paul is addressing believers here in Ephesians chapter 5, when he says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave Himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. And then he goes on to put this in context, because this is a very significant part of uh, walking in love, and that is, uh, avoiding sexual immorality. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard among you." He's writing to Christians. This is God's gift that He's given us not to use it in inappropriate ways, selfishly, or in immoral ways. Uh, should not even be heard among you. And it, and it is proper for saints. See, he's writing to believers. Using the word saints, he means those of you who have been set apart 
as God's children. And then he, he gets very specific. Coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving of thanks. And it's rather interesting. Uh, uh, I just did a uh, men's uh, seminar where a group of men had gone through the study of a book that I wrote called The Measure of a Man, which is based upon the qualifications and the qualities, I should say, and the characteristics of maturity in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. And I had the men share openly how this experience had impacted their life, studying these characteristics. And afterwards, there was a, an old gentleman came up to me. I think he was about 81 years old. And he said, I just want to tell you something. He said, going through this study, I was convicted about something. He said, I used to and it was very recent in his past, he said, I used to really enjoy telling off-color jokes. I could really make people laugh. Now this is a Christian. He's been a Christian for some time. But going through the study and looking at passages like this, he said, I realize that that was wrong and it's sinful. And I'm not going to be telling any more stories or jokes, uh, crude joking that is not suitable. It's not a reflection of godliness. And it kind of just tickled me a little bit to hear this old man talking. And he was just dead serious. Because after that point of studying the Scriptures, he didn't think that that, he thought that was just fine. And he used that to get attention, really, to make people laugh. And uh, my response was, I said, well, don't stop telling jokes. There are a lot of good jokes. But thank God for what He's done in your life. And so it's interesting how some Christians allow the worldly system to come into their lives, affect their values, affect the way they relate to other people. And so the point that I'm making here is that this is one of God's great gifts, the gift of sex. And yet, what is the brunt of jokes more than any other subject relating to our lives. Again and again, that's the brunt of humor, which is taking God's gift and abusing it and misusing it. And so the principle just basically uh, reads that uh, in using the freedom that God has given us, we should always make decisions that are within his will. And God gives us these principles to guide us in all of our activities and all that we do.